Professor Mearsheimer alluded to, which is that the Biden administration officials, so many of them, are of a different, they grew up in the unipolar moment. So they don't have the experience of uh, the Cold War and a dual. <coughs> well, I think one of the problems is that our diplomacy since the late 1990s has been virtually the opposite of that which we used to in the Cold War. Um, we had several, I would say, uh, operational principles when we began to negotiate an end to the Cold War. We seemed to be almost at its height around 1983, 1984. But we decided that we would start, first of all, trying to look for areas of common interest and concentrate more attention on them. Second, to listen very carefully to what the Soviets were saying, to stay always in communication. And though President Reagan, for example, condemned the Soviet Union as an evil empire, he never insulted any Soviet leader. He treated them with respect. And when he met them personally, uh, his first words were usually, we hold the peace in our hands, we must act responsibly. And, you know, uh, then also issues like human rights and so on, which were largely comments on their internal affairs, we began to shift more to a private conversation rather than public condemnations and public demands, which we understood would be, you know, tend to be rejected. And within about a three year period, we had uh, found uh, that since it was in the interest of both countries to end the arms race, to end uh, the confrontation, we negotiated an end and it was not a defeat for the Soviet Union. Uh, now, since then, we have the idea that somehow we won the Cold War in, a, in the sense that Russia was defeated. No, the Soviet Union, we ended it with the Soviet Union two years before the Soviet Union broke up. It broke up not because of our pressure from the outside, but because of problems inside. But, you know, beginning in the late 90s and the first such move uh, was the decision to start expanding NATO. And at first it was acceptable, but it should have been clear from the very beginning. If we were going to expand NATO, we had to stop at a certain point. There was going to be a red line. And I joined, uh, 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 you know, I joined George Cannon and others in testifying to the Senate that a decision to expand NATO would be one of the worst strategic decisions we could have made since the end of the Cold War. Uh, but even so, we could have gotten by with it if we had, if it had just included a few East European countries. So it seems to me that then we started a, a policy of in effect treating Russia as if it were a defeated nation. At the same time, uh, we interfered directly in their own elections. So we were very much involved in the 1996 election that, uh, that re-elected uh, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, then we, in, and also, then we began to walk out of almost every arms control treaty, which had been the basis of our ending the Cold War. Uh, and then uh, when uh, Putin began to complain about some of the things we were doing, like uh, putting uh, anti-ballistic missiles in Eastern Europe. Uh, we, uh, we simply ignored that. We never addressed his complaints, most of which I would consider quite valid from a Russian point of view. It was not that necessarily all of them were totally accurate, but they, were, they represented perceptions which we should have dealt with. Instead, we increasingly not only the media, uh, the principal media, but the government began to personalize everything. And 
I think that uh, we played a role in creating the Vladimir Putin that we see today, including giving him precedence for what he is doing. And why we can't recognize that is beyond me.